Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 5 a.m. Master Scrum Show. This is um, where we're doing some interviews of people that work in the industry, work with the agile folks and teams and people that just want to share some things that may be of value to our, the listeners and viewers of our show. And this is about Amit Kumar, who is a manager of teams, development teams. He's done a couple of things. And Amit, share a little bit about yourself. So first of all, um, a very warm hello to all of your listeners. Um, like, like, like you said, I work as a manager of application development, um, managing few teams, been working in Agile for a while, um, love the concept of Agile, and I try to use Agile by, by, the, by the core definition of the term Agile. So not just with, with what the Agile framework or the Agile methodology is, how people tend to use it. I try to go by the little meaning of Agile. And if if there is a way where I can fit this in with the team and the people that I'm working with, yeah. uh, if I have to bend a few rules here and there, um, then I'll, I'll go with it. Because if, if, if that works for the team, if that works for the people, uh, I, I don't mind bending those rules. Yeah. Sometimes I notice, though, they don't want to bend at all, and then you got to bend them. <laughs> You're like, yeah. okay, we got to try something. They're so scared to... Uh, to make change. And just so everyone knows, Amit and I have been, I say, crossing paths through our careers. There's a lot of people that you will meet in your lifetime that you're going to cross paths with, come back forth and stuff like that. So you always want to make good contacts with good people. And I would say Amit is a very good contact and good person to know. Um, So what do you like? So let's talk about your experience as manager of development teams. What... Can you get into some bad days or good days? What what's what's a good day when you're a manager of of development teams in there? What what does that look like? A good day. A good day. What's a good day look like for you? A good day for me would be um, where I don't get any call from my team saying we are uh, stuck in an issue or we need someone to help with where the team has already taken care of the obstacles. Mm -hmm. They 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 collaborated, they worked together, um, or they were able to identify a potential obstacle that could happen in that sprint. So I, I like to work sprint by sprint right, with, with my team. So yeah. I'll always be talking in, in, in those, looking at the, those, those smaller milestones. So if, if they identify something that could become a potential um, roadblock, or uh, could be a potential pitfall for us. Yeah. And they took care of it. And I didn't have to worry about that. Basically, if, if I if I don't get any call from my team, I know everything's going good. And all I um all all I get to do is at the end of the day just look at the board, things are moving on. That for me is a is a is an ideal day. Yeah. And I'll add I think what what you said, I like it when I see them handling issues on their own without coming to me how yeah. do you greg how do you want to solve this problem yeah. Yeah. i'm like you're all professionals you're all grown-ups on that you you can figure it out and then they they figure it out themselves and i'm like they're getting it how to how to work with each other to solve the problem yeah and, and the reason i said that as an as an ideal day is a where i'm working less mm -hmm. b if i'm the smartest guy in the in the meeting and and helping them drive then I have done a bad job with setting up the right team. Yeah. C, I have, I have, my team feels confident enough that they can make decisions. Yep. They can open up, they can identify a problem, they can talk about a problem, and they also feel empowered enough to go and solve the problem. Yeah, definitely. Where if, 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 if something went wrong, they're not, they, they, they don't have that fear that somebody's going to come and ask them, why did you do that? Why did you make that call? Why did you yeah. do that? Yeah. yeah. No, so, so, that, so that that's why that's why that that thing for me is is an ideal day. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've been there, been there, done that. Had some PhDs, and I'm like, I am not the smartest person in the room. <laughs> and if you want me to tell you what to do, then why am I hiring a PhD in the first place? You know, kind of things like that. So, with that said, of good days. What about those bad days? What do you want? what would you like your teams to understand about your position? Cause you're kind of in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. You're, 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 you're managing the teams. You're also not the senior executive VP. You're in the mid middle there. 
what do you want them to understand about your role when it comes between the team and the high level executives, maybe stakeholders, stuff like that? So I view my role, um, people who are in that mid-level management, right? Mm -hmm. Managers, senior managers, maybe directors somewhere. We are not at the at the big table. We are not mm-hmm. playing at, at the high stake tables, right? We are not the VPs. Right. We are not the C suite where we are involved in those critical decisions that are going to be money driven or strategy driven or whatever the direction they want to move to. Right. We are not playing at that table. We are not playing at the table below where we are the ones doing the work. Like I need to go write a code to make sure things are working to make a functionality, right? Mm-hmm. We are in, in that middle layer where we are managing up, we are managing down. We are acting as a filter for noise coming from up so people below can keep working. Mm-hmm. At the same time, make sure that the and any issues that people at, at the at the ground level have, their concerns are are spun up in a way where they are not neglected and they are heard and they're valued, right? So with that role, it, it becomes a, a good a good um, balancing act. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know how to phrase it in, in a way where it, it, it's, it's in my head. Um, let's let's come back to that in, in a okay. few minutes where I have the, the right phrase to uh, right way to phrase it for you. Okay, so um... I was just thinking about this. I didn't give this as a question before, but I know that you kind of sometimes act as a scrum master slash product owner, and you've done it in multiple companies that you work for. Yeah. How how was that working for you and not working? What would you kind of wish you could do, or how does that fitting? Um. Since I do do an agile show, I got to ask a scrum type question. <laughs> no, it, it, it's a good question because in most of the teams I have worked in or where my friends are working in, mm-hmm. you don't have the the luxury of people doing one specific role. Okay. Right. You're, you're always trying to, um, to either have an overlap of positions where one person is putting on multiple hats to do it. So that's 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 everywhere. So you you have to walk around. That's why I said I like to bend the rules wherever I can right. to be flexible for the team and and work there. But is that ideal? Is it ideal? No. Yeah. But there is always a difference between an ideal world and a real world. Okay. So in reality, in in a real world, you have to do it. There's no getting on the fact there where there uh, there are times where I have to help the QA team or I have to help um, the dev team go take care of wherever I, I can help them. Maybe some analysis, maybe a short query somewhere, or maybe a short piece of code, which I can go maybe design something for them. So you, you, you have to, I see myself as someone you, you place it to, to, to fill a hole for mm-hmm. a temporary basis or so, sort of an, an, an ER nurse, right? right? I go put a bandaid, put a bandaid somewhere. So the bleeding is stopped by the time my, my surgeons and, and specialists can come in and then take care of the things. Or maybe I can do an initial analysis for them. And this is me giving an example of what I do in, in a right. team. Same way I have people in my team who are playing multiple roles at different times to fill the role or to do the work that's needed for the team to keep moving forward. Because at the end of the day, there is a work that has to be delivered. Mm-hmm. There's a team that needs to be led. And there's a team that's that's working hard to deliver the work. Yeah. So how you get the best of all the pieces together and make that complete picture, it's it's... There, there's no set um, rule for that. So you always have to see what's going on and then play around. Okay, cool. Um, I noticed you a couple of years back or you decided to switch companies. What were you looking for that you could not find in your old position that made you look around or incur- and made you curious, let's just say? What were you missing? Um, I like to be challenged. Mm-hmm. And I like to be working um, in a place or on a project where 
something's going to wake me up at two in the morning and say, I miss doing that. Or when I'm taking a shower and a cold water falls on my head, something, some window opens up and say, this is what I'm missing. This is what I need to go and try. I'll say, I don't miss the 2 a.m. thing. <laughs> I'm good. You don't have to call me at 2 a.m. <laughs> um, and, and sometimes when you are there at a place for a long time and you keep doing the same thing and it becomes more of, uh, you, you, you get into a comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And I felt I was in a comfort zone. Um, I was looking for more challenges, something new to be, mm-hmm. to, to keep myself motivated and keep, keep working, keep growing. I want to grow. I'm, I'm an ambitious person. I want to grow. Yeah. To keep growing, keep doing something new, something, some, something more challenging. But that's not always what's going to be fit for the other side as well, right? There, there's me as an employee who's working there and there is an employer who has me working there. So it, it has to work for both. It, it can't just be everything going my way or everything going the other side. Yeah. So but you need to have that, that, that healthy balance. Um, I just felt that over there, that, that balance was, was not come where we both could not come in the middle somewhere. So, yeah. Yeah. I just, um, I didn't know if you're going to say like money years ago when I was really young, my father was a VP engineer, civil engineer. Mm-hmm. And he was telling me how he had one engineer come to him and mm-hmm. say, I would like to learn X, earn X amount of dollars, which was way more than they were pricing them out mm-hmm. on the jobs. And my father was honest with them. and says, your position is priced out at this rate. Yeah. I says, you want this rate. I says, I can't do that. But if you find a place you want to go to, mm-hmm. he's like, I'm more than happy to write you recommendation. If you can find a place that'll pay what you want, go for it. So sometimes that that dwells in there too. They think they want to get to the next level, but there really isn't no openings at the next level. And sometimes, so I was curious if that was one of the No, things. I mean, again, I'm, I'm no saint either, right? We yeah. all want money. We want, we want money is never enough, right? right? They, there was a stage in life and I was young coming up, mm-hmm. um, trying to gain experience and, oh, my friend got moved around. He got a new job. Yeah. He got a high raise. All right, let me do the same thing. So th- there was a time and did that. Now, yeah. Work in 19, 20 years, you 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 tend to get away from that, and you you see more right. at where you want to get into a, a, a good right. place where you're working. You have good work that that mm-hmm. keeps you challenging, keeps you motivated, and you want to go back to work the next day. Yeah, you want that that challenge, that interest, that, that which you can span your thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, on similar to that, what strategies would you recommend or give a couple little? Because we do a practical and tactical. Mm-hmm. And I was always like, you got any practical or tactical advice for managing an agile team or mm-hmm. semi agile team? Let's just put it that way. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're not completely agile, but mm-hmm. or completely scrum team. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any practical advice as far as that goes for managing those types of teams? Um, I can share my experience. Is it an advice? I don't know. Um, so, so my last two projects or, or the last two places that I worked mm-hmm. on my last two teams, we were sort of getting into Agile. Mm-hmm. And prior to that, I had worked for almost five, six years where I was in, in hardcore, fully Agile team where I had business stakeholders sitting with me during the refining session, yeah. business stakeholders sitting with me during sprint planning. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked at a place where we had um, a sprint planning on Wednesdays. So in the morning we were doing a sprint planning. Mm-hmm. In the afternoon, the whole team was taken out for lunch by the by the product owner. Okay. And in the evening, we are sitting together doing refining. And the product owner is there doing the refining. Right. Yeah. We split the day in, into two parts. By 334, we we're all done with, with our uh, ceremonies for, for that sprint. Mm-hmm. We instead of having a weekly, we, we did that on, on, on a on a Wednesday. We, we, we used to have three week sprints. Okay. 334, everybody's done. All right, let's play ping pong. You want to do something else in the in the entertainment area. Mm-hmm. Relax. All right. Get ready for the sprint and you go home. Right. So coming from there, where I get into um the new place, and the first thing I get asked by the HR is, Oh, I see Agile on your um on your resume. Yeah. And um we have been um our CIO is is moving towards uh Agile, and he said we want to go in Agile with small a. Small a. Small a. 
I still so, figured uh, out what small a and big a is. Uh, and that was the first time. I, uh, yeah, that's yeah. the first time I had heard agile is small yeah. a to me. Either you're agile yeah. or you're fragile. You, yeah. you 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 can't be both. So yeah. so th- those are experiences when when you start there and mm-hmm. how you share your experience, what you have learned, and how you keep learning on the um on the project. Mm-hmm. You're working with team. That's why I said that that agile. I took the term literally because. I could have come back and said, I've worked in Agile. This is how we do it. This is a framework. This is the methodology. We're going to do this. But it, it would be too much too soon and sort of enforcing yourself on the team, not letting them take in and absorb what Agile provides you, how the benefit is and how it, it, it won't motivate them to take it in. It will be more of you enforcing them on the team. Right. So started in a, in a, in a more lighter approach where let's, let's take the, fr- let's, let's keep the structure in place mm-hmm. where Right, we are going to do the sprint planning. We, we work yeah. in those three big sprints. Try to try to break the work down. So always go with with that breaking the work down approach first, mm-hmm. because that always helps. Yeah. You if you want to control the scope, you want to deliver the work. You want to keep it in, to keep the price in check. I feel all of those are best accomplished by breaking the work into smaller pieces. Yep. You know you have more control in the work. You know what you have to do. You know when you have to stop. Yeah. Or when you have to pivot back, so it it, it all becomes e- smaller things are easier to manage yeah. than a big one. So start with that. Start with that structure. If if you can if you can get that in place, you start. You motivate or or get the team in the habit of thinking how I can break this work into a smaller module that I can easily work on and yeah. deliver. Then you can play around and build your whole agile thing. Then you can start making your backlog, do your refining, bring your stakeholders in, do your sprint reviews. You can do all of those good things. But if you can start with that one small thing of how you can break this work Mm -hmm. and let's take a smaller piece of work, smaller chunk, work on it. Maybe I would have a developer not write code for eight hours a day. He or she would be working four hours and he or she would be collaborating with somebody else for those four hours, helping them complete their work. To me, that's the productive day. And then it'll deliver. How does that go over with um, managers and old school wise where you t- tell them, I'm not having them code all day long. They're going to code. They're going to partner. They're going to share and they're going to do more of the T-shaped learning, yeah. you know, cross ball. How's that go? Good, it's, bad? It's, it uh, let's, let's just say it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's, 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 it's a challenge. And you you hope that by the end of certain point in time that they see the value that they're getting. Mm-hmm. That you went with the prior approach. Oh, I want everybody typing yeah. for eight hours a day. If you're not typing the the code, if you're not being uh, hitting the keyboard for eight hours, you're not productive. Mm-hmm. To yeah, I was working for four or five hours. Was writing the code, but I spent the, the rest three hours collaborating with A, B, and C, and I helped A finish his work. I helped B finish her use case, and I finished help C write their test cases. So in a productive day, we actually got more done than me just working um, in a silo in front of my laptop in a dark room and writing my code. And everyone has a higher quality level of work too, because Correct. you're getting different viewpoints on how they do it and pieces that make it a little better so that that's awesome um so what are keys to motivating your team what's your favorite way of doing this lately like if you had to motivate your team mm-hmm. you know what what's a good way what is something you might do food always helps food yes food, food. always helps you you take them out for lunch or you get some some snacks for them food food always helps okay um other thing that that helps is um, a, a, a transparent communication. What I have seen is, yeah, um, where I started with teams which were not agile, and especially post COVID, when people are working from yeah. home, and you don't interact that much with with people, so mm-hmm. you, you are no longer working with a work friend or making work friends, right, or, or collaborating with people. You are working with a monitor, mm-hmm. right? There, there's a face if you're lucky. If not, you're you're talking to a blank screen yeah right yeah somebody is behind the screen i don't know who you are yeah i've not seen your face for years mm-hmm. um if you happen to switch job like i did then you might not even 
see their face for i don't know how long so yeah. you just have a voice and and a black screen to to talk to so when when those things happen and if you if you be transparent with those people and explain to them your point of view mm-hmm. i think that that also helps the team where they might not agree with you 100% right but at least on a few occasions they'll start seeing what the other side is okay and and that then helps them see all right i've been working in my way if i do more collaboration or if i work in in a in a, in a different way mm-hmm. it might be more more helpful and when we see that those small things coming in and gaining um in a a delivery a work delivery a task delivery right. that motivates them because n- nothing works best than seeing that you work in something and it's actually working and delivered yeah. oh yeah no i'm a big done thing they people i'm working on something like don't you feel much better when it gets off your plate and it's yeah. done and it's you're moving cuz i feel so much more refreshed and i i think a lot of teams i've coached in the past are like that too um once they get stuff done and they get to try something new they're more excited more energized more you know energetic on the next thing oh i get another one give me another one let me get it done um so how have you helped the team in the past that you're really proud of give an example of something that you did from a team perspective managing the team not from what you did personally from a coding perspective but um interacted managed the team take the the role like you're in um that really made you proud of what you did like if you would put that on your resume that uh you know or you show up that off in an interview kind of type thing i don't put on my resume but you know, when somebody asks a question i do try to um use that as as, as an example mm-hmm. um in my my last team i had i had two senior resources dev resources mm mm-hmm. and had one senior qa resource yeah so they were my holy trinity mm-hmm. my team was built around those three and then i had other people in the team i had an onshore offshore model i had both the dev resources qa resources offshore yep and then i had these three people here so i believe they were with me worked with me for almost 4 4 five years i believe yeah. the dev resources have been with me for almost 6 years yeah so they they were um three were the oldest team members and and around them is where i built my team on yeah. what their strengths are who can come and complement their weaknesses mm-hmm. so i get so I, i can work around them and and keep building the team around them because the way i always see a team is mm-hmm. and this is when even i was working as as a developer i was coming up gaining experience that in in a typical six seven people team you have one or two people who basically drive the team yeah they, they they are the brains of the team then you would have one or two people who are going to be good at taking the direction and then keep 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 working on them right yeah and you always have one or two in the team who are not the 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 strongest resources they would bring something else to the team they might be good at motivating the team mm-hmm. they might be the glue that keeps the team together just to keep yeah. a light and they, they might not be the, the sharpest coder in the team right but they would bring their own values to the team So that that's how I view a, a six or seven people team as. Okay. By the time I left um at least for the last 7 8 months. Yeah. I didn't have to worry about any um any requirement sessions meetings going on, mm-hmm. any design meetings going on. I didn't have to worry about um what the test cases are that needs to be discussed with the stakeholders, right. what the results are, what the QA timelines are. Uh-huh. These three were taking care of things. and i was basically sitting in a meeting and think yeah good yeah it's done so you really had a self organizing team that was it was a self organizing team yeah. by the end those three who were running the show for me i didn't worry about anything i could focus on doing things that i wanted to do yeah. which i couldn't do in my in my role because i had those specific responsibilities now because they are taking care of that now i can bro- um, broaden my horizon yeah. and start looking at something else So and, so and you didn't have anybody on the team complaining about those three, no, right? No. So they had a good working relationship. So mm-hmm. it wasn't that the three people took over and dictated what everyone should Correct. do, right? It's Correct. not it's not a no. dictation type thing yet. Correct. Correct. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I had one um one of my I got I can always tell stories, but as you know, um I had my favorite ones are usually QA people. 
Mm-hmm. When I develop an agile team to work really well, where the QA and the dev are working really tight, mm-hmm. everyone has always come back to me years later after, or they went back to the old way they were working. They all tell me, Greg, I miss those days where QA, everybody wants to split them apart. This is QA over here. This is dev over here. I, I, right? I don't get that. To, to me, QA resources and the dev resources to me it's it's a dev team that dev team consists of people who are writing code to to do programming or whatever you are doing that yes. and there are resources who are testing the code right to me that's a dev team yeah and these dev resources and qa resources are like husband and wife yeah they can't live without each other they can't live with each other yeah so you you need them working in in harmony in in, in sync i like that description that's yeah. actually pretty good i never heard of that one before but that's a new one you know what? I think it does. You need each other to to really grow as a family, to grow as a team. And if you try to split them apart, mm-hmm. it will just actually implode, you know? You you, so, you will never get a cure resource who is not complaining that the dev resource are not giving them the right information. Yeah. And or they don't have the, they don't have enough details from the from the dev team. Yeah. And you will never find a developer who doesn't come back and say, the cure resource doesn't not know what he or she's yeah. testing. I have to help them. So that's why I said they, they are like like a couple. They are working together. They have to work together and they can't live without each other. And I find the more you get them to work together, the better in the long term. Yeah. They yeah. start knowing each other. Just like a, you know, that's funny. You, this is a great analogy. The husband, wife, whatever, the spouse, you know, the significant other, you can almost answer each other's questions. Yeah. You know exactly what they're thinking. I mean, they're totally, you could totally disagree with it, but yeah. you kind of know where they're heading. And if you're yeah. testing something, you kind of understand how they put it together and, when you get responses back from the QA, you kind of know why they're asking that question. Yeah, I forgot about that, right? You know, so cool. That's actually really, I don't think that's ever been said before. I love it. That's a great one. Um, so speaking of continuous learning, and you kind of mentioned about you like the challenges. Mm-hmm. So now you're an adjunct professor at Villanova. So we got a fancy title now. He's a professor, mm-hmm. everyone, you know. Not, um, not, not, not the money heist one. No, no, not no, yet. Not, they not, they not probably pay you nothing to just make no. you just go for name alone. You're looking for a status. Um, so how did this come about and and how what brought you into that role? So I was doing my MBA. Um and I initially wanted to do my MBA in uh, in healthcare as at the specialization. Mm-hmm. But then shifted focus, got more interested in cybersecurity as I had a good team that could take care of the work mm-hmm. so I could work on on different side of, of work. So it got involved with uh, with uh, with cybersecurity, mm-hmm. got interested in that. So I thought, let me go ahead and, and do some more learning on that side. So okay. that's that's how I got into, um, that's how I did my cybersecurity specialization for, for my MBA. Um, the professor who was teaching me um, secure software development, and um, he had one, one more class with me. So this is what my bread and butter is: software development, right? And uh, security added to added to the mix. So I, yeah. that that class was very nice for me, but I, but I could, I I could provide a lot of input, a lot of of practical real life examples of, of mm-hmm. how things work. Okay. So at the end, I asked the professor at the end of the class that if you ever need me with any of your new classes or with your undergrad students where they need certain help or they need guidance, feel free to reach out to me. I'm mean, I. I loved my time at, at the university. I, I did my MBA from Villanova University. Right. I, I loved my time here and I'd be more than happy to give back something to the university. I, I would I'd mm-hmm. love to do that. The professor then um, took it a step further, went ahead and talked to the dean and um, okay. said, why don't you come in and start teaching? I'm like, I've never done this before. Mm-hmm. Like, no, you, you will be good. So that that's how the, the whole conversation started. And then um, here I am. So you got the challenge. So now you're really you kind of getting a challenge, mm-hmm. different thing. Yeah. You're at that where you're sharing. So now yeah. you know why I do the show. Yeah. Um, but but basically that's pretty cool. That's a great way. And but you offered that, right? So mm-hmm. you're continuously learning. So now you're continuing continuously learning how to be a professor, how to yeah. teach, how yeah. to deal with adult learning and all that kind of stuff too. Now, are you teaching adults mostly, or is it also um regular school, college level? So okay. right now I'm teaching the undergrad students. Oh, undergrad. Oh, even yeah. better. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, I hope you're enjoy- you're enjoying it. Yeah, I've, I've had one semester under my belt. This is the second one. Okay. And um, yeah, so far loving it. 
Okay. I, I, I just hope the kids are loving that too. It's just not me. Yeah, it's 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 fun that way. Yeah. Um so now it says on your LinkedIn profile, right? Mm-hmm. You're the you're an MBA cybersecurity specialist, okay? And in there, so one and and maybe we in the future we can do a show where we talk about how does cybersecurity security work with an agile team? Because I'll be honest with you. When I see these big companies, they separate cybersecurity away from the scrum teams. And I have a whole philosophy on that. But I would love to hear from you as someone who worked with the dev teams. Now is teaching cybersecurity. I mean, so you're now getting into that game. How could or you see we can do be a better job of integrating the agile teams, the development teams with cybersecurity? Any any thoughts, tips? Um I think cybersecurity topic is, is such a wide topic. It'd be very hard to cover here in, in this one. Maybe we could, mm-hmm. like you said, we could have a, a, a secondary conversation. Um, I would we, might even, we might even do a meetup because yeah. that might be a good meetup where you'll get all these people from different angles that ask you questions. Because I know they've all been hit with the security. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I know what you're saying. Um, I, I look at your question and I, rather I would answer your question in, in two parts, okay. because that's how I see this. Mm-hmm. So your first part was about teaching at, at the university, right? Cybersecurity with mm-hmm. people who are going to the future, right? They're mm-hmm. they're coming in. So I, I always make a statement in my, in my class that they just can't rely on the books. Mm-hmm. Because, so let's say whatever the trend today is, let's take AI, mm-hmm. right? Someone writing a book on AI today, mm-hmm. on 26 January right now, or whatever the, the date is, I don't even know it is. So their their knowledge right now is based on what they know today. Mm-hmm. They will take four to five months to write a book. It goes through the whole publishing process. Somebody is going to proofread it, and so by the time it comes out in the market in somebody's hand, it's going to be seven to eight months. Mm-hmm. In that seven to eight months, that's the book that someone is going to start reading in in school or in college. Mm-hmm. You're already seven months behind. The technology has moved on. So what I tell um, my students in the class is try to be as current with, with what's going on as you can. Right. Go read the blogs. Go read where, what size is the wind blowing. And then I also try to help them not just from someone who's going to come and maintain an application mm-hmm. on the cybersecurity side, also as a consumer of that, how you can keep your yourself safe. Good. So that's from, from, the, from the teaching side. Okay. When when I answer your question as as a manager of app development, where I have to now secure my applications, mm-hmm. and I know why you said that you you have a, a a preset thing in concept in mind on how teams and and companies focus on this and why it's not part of the sprint. Right. If if you if you if you look at it, most of the companies, right, most of the organizations, they didn't they didn't have that focus on cybersecurity. Until three, four, five years back. Yeah, it's true. That was not not they were not that focused. Right. And every company, every big company, small company, is now relying on an an on a digital platform or an right. IT based solution to carry out their business. Right. Those applications are not just written in the last four or five years. Those applications have been in business for a long time. Right. That's why every company has a big um a a tech dev backlog or a IT proactive mean whatever you want to call it mm-hmm. different different come with different terms but at the end of the day you have a bunch of legacy applications that right. you are carrying with you because they're crucial to your business and you have to update them now something that you're building right now it's easier to get into it and say all right we are going to add some security tools in in our in our devops pipeline mm-hmm. or we are bring in some automated um uh, products that's going to help us write secure code. We can yeah. do a lot more testing, a lot more static testing, dynamic testing. You can fit that in in a in a sprint for the work that you're doing brand new. It's right. it's, it's easier to do that way. You're working on it. You can test it. If your code doesn't pass, the DevOps pipeline will fail, and you go back and fix the security vulnerabilities and you release the code. All good, very nice. But those legacy applications which are sitting there for years, those are already built in. Yeah. Any change that happens there, you have to do a thorough analysis of what the change is, what's, which, which areas am I going to change, and what's the impact, what is my dev impact, what is my QA impact, 
and do do I is is, is that legacy framework still okay. supported where I can go and make those changes, or is that framework that old that it's no longer even supported by the vendor who created the framework? Right. So how many security um, vulnerabilities or gaps can I go and fill in? So it, it becomes a bigger conversation on dealing with those legacy applications. And every company has those. Every company is is driving that that big, heavy pile of legacy applications or legacy framework or whatever you call them. Things that are pre-built that you want to introduce security in. Mm-hmm. So building something new from scratch, you start the first floor, you can you mm-hmm. incorporate the right thing. But when you already have a building built in, going and making it secure, it, it's always going to be tough. So yeah. that's why that is the biggest challenge which every company has. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll just throw in my little, and I, I love the way you describe that because it's so true. One of the things that I think, kind of like we talk about QA and dev, mm-hmm. and then there's security and there's DevOps and so on. And I go, well, there should be more conversation. Mm-hmm. I would love to have more work. Okay, security people, help teach the dev teams to better understand what you need to do your job mm-hmm. so it doesn't go off there for for a month for you yeah. to test it. Yeah. Help them prep it so that your time using it or testing it or validating whatever is smaller. You know, just don't get, you know, anytime someone would drop something on me that I had no idea what it's, of course it's going to take longer. Yeah. You know, build that little bit of relation. I can go in on more and we'll, well, I will definitely have a security discussion from an Azure perspective um, because I think it's needed mm-hmm. in the world, to be honest with you. I think it's still a, a security and an Agile and a DevOps, I think, they're or QA even. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I mean, think- the, the other piece there is when, when you look at those those older applications, mm-hmm. if you if you do a thorough analysis of them, and I've done for a, for a few projects and a few applications, you look at good amount of work to right. go make them change, to make those changes and then oh, yeah. QA them, release them. And if, if someone's working on it in a two week sprint or a three week sprint, mm-hmm. that the changing that one piece itself yeah. is a good amount of work. Yeah. And it, sometimes it becomes practically impossible to break it down to such a small piece that you can do in three weeks, dev, test and deliver because mm-hmm. those legacy applications or the older ones, they have their claws everywhere. Yeah. Some might be a monolithic application. Some might be an older application, which is maybe an, an API that's been consumed by a lot of places. So mm-hmm. yeah, I can make this change in the sprint. I can go ahead and make this. Or how do we finish the testing of all of those pieces? Yeah. So that becomes a challenge. Or it, it becomes challenging where we have a team of these many X developers and QA resources. Yeah. We have new business coming in. We have new business requirements, right? Mm-hmm. We want this new shiny enhancement coming in. Yep. We want to get this done and get in the market. All right. So in a three-week sprint, you have X number of resources. Do you want them focusing on this or focusing on that? Right. 99.9% of the time, let's go work on this new enhancement, this new functionality, because it's going to bring in more revenue. Let's yep. do this first. We'll come back to this to the security piece. Yeah. And yeah. that's where then the security guys start beating the drums. When will this be done then? Yeah. You are writing more code. You're going to write more code. They're going to keep on increasing the backlog there. When are you going to work on it? Yeah. So it becomes a very, very good conversation and very yeah. uncomfortable yeah. situation to, to handle both. So that's what I say. It, 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 it's, it's a longer conversation. It gets into your definition done, right? What's your yes. definition done? How much security do you put in there? Yeah. And I, if you do pointing or sizing stuff, I used to, at one comp was like, oh, they're like, oh, we're getting really good at it. But yeah, well, you know what? Don't be playing with the points yet because we got to throw in documentation. Yeah. <laughs> and they didn't when they weren't doing documentation. Like, oh, so you're going to do, you might up the points on the complexity of what you have to do, but you're not doing as many stories in that process. You're doing the same number of points yep. because it's now more complex than what you were basing everything on. But now you're just doing less number of stories, but they're more quality based. So. Great. Well, Mitt, it's been great having you on here. I think I think you're going to open people's eyes to that different to a couple of different areas, everything from being that uh, manager slash scrum master slash product owner between 
the man, the higher level executives and the board and, and the teams and, and also from your security, your cybersecurity. I think you open up a lot of different avenues and definitely I want to invite you to do another show and even one of our meetups to talk about cybersecurity and, and IT teams and stuff. Maybe we even ask you about managers. I don't know. We can have you for two different topics. I think it'll be good. Um, so I hope you'll show up for that. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, was, it was good fun. And yeah. I think next time when we talk, um, we'll definitely get back to the question which I skipped at the beginning. And I forgot what the question was, but I said I'll, I'll come back to it later where I was missing the the right way to phrase my my answer. But we'll, we'll, come, we'll, we'll, we'll do that we'll later. We'll figure it out. Yeah. I think there's enough meat on here. We only do a little bit. It's not take everyone's time. So I think it was perfect. And with that, I want to say thank you very much. Um, we're going to do more stuff with the 5 a.m. Master Scrum Show, more interviews, more meetups. Sign up for the meetup and everything, and you'll get news on that. Thank you, Amit, and you have a great day. You as well, man.